Welcome to Comic Tropes, I'm your host Chris. Today I want to talk to you about one of my favorite artists. Now, it's always tricky when making a show like this and you're covering somebody that you especially like because you don't want it just to gush over the artwork, you want to have some insightful analysis. But I think the subject of today's video, and that is the artwork of John Romita Jr., I think he has an interesting story to tell. So we're going to break this down by looking at four areas of this subject, and that includes taking a look at him breaking into comics, along with the potential accusations of nepotism that that brought, the evolution of his style, what I'll argue that he does well, and finally, we'll take a look at some of the common criticisms against his artwork. So, please consider hitting things like like and subscribe if you enjoy these videos, and without any further ado, let's get into it. The important thing to know about John Romita Jr. is that his father was also a comics artist. But John Romita Sr. wasn't just an artist, he was a superstar artist. There's a lot to cover about his work history, but what's germane to today's episode is the fact that Romita Sr. was an incredibly popular Spider-Man artist. When Steve Ditko, the co-creator of Spider-Man, abruptly left after issue 38, Stan Lee had Romita Sr. take over. And these are two artists with very different styles. Ditko made Spidey weird, and that uniqueness caught everyone's attention. Romita Sr.'s version had a bulkier physique and gave the lead character of Peter Parker more traditional leading man good looks. But what's important is that John Romita Sr.'s art connected with readers. The Romita Sr. version of Spider-Man was the look that was used in all of Marvel's licensed products and merchandise. John Romita Sr. also famously co-created characters like Rhino and Kingpin and designed the look of Mary Jane Watson. And in 1972, Romita Sr. became Marvel's art director, responsible for approving the visuals of the characters and the comics overall. So, when John Romita Jr. wanted to become a comic book artist like his father, he faced an uphill battle because he was vulnerable to accusations of nepotism. Romita Sr. said, quote, At the time, it was a fact that most second-generation artists never really make it. And he explained, quote, I thought, oh my god, if he fails, I won't be able to talk about my business with my son anymore. I was terrified to hire him. I was art director, so I could recommend artists for work, but I didn't want to do it because my instinct told me he would suffer taunts of nepotism. I really didn't want John up there, and I didn't really want him to be in comics. It wasn't like I was mad that he was in, I just preferred that he wouldn't be in it. I was hoping he'd go into advertising. Ramita Jr. would go on to get an advertising degree at Farmingdale State College. Was John Ramita Jr. successful because of nepotism? I would argue against it. I mean, yes, at age 13 he did send Stan Lee the idea for The Prowler and that made it into the comics, but that's kind of its own deal. I would say that if he failed to connect with readers but Marvel was giving him high-profile assignments, yes, that would have been nepotism. But instead, John Romita Jr. did go to college, and then he started at Marvel at the very bottom. According to John Romita Jr., he was absolutely in love with the superhero art of his father and John Buscema, and he could not be discouraged from getting into comics. He got a job at Marvel working as a production assistant for about 18 months. During that time, Marvel gave him a six-page Spider-Man backup story, which would be his first artwork for the company. And Romita Jr. says it was not good enough for print, but Al Milgram saved it in inking. Romita Jr. was next given the job of layouts on Iron Man, where he was inked by Bob Layton beginning in 1978. Ramita's first full comic was issue 115, and his collaboration with Layton on inks began the following issue. He says he does not look back at that time fondly, because he felt Leighton took as much credit for inking as Romita was for penciling. He said that Leighton covered over his artwork, but that he learned solid storytelling from it, and he learned some humility. Iron Man was very well received, and in the early 80s, Romita Jr. followed in his father's footsteps by becoming the artist on Amazing Spider-Man. 
Now let's get into discussing the evolution of John Romita Jr.'s art style, because if you look at some of that early artwork on Iron Man and then maybe last week's work on Amazing Spider-Man, there is a vast world of difference there, but if we look close enough, maybe we can see some of the same fundamentals underlying the style. Romita is an artist whose style has evolved. While it's all on a continuum, you can note distinct periods in his artwork. His initial run on Spider-Man, for instance, is very close to Marvel's house style and is clearly influenced by his father's artwork. Then you could cut to his experimental run on Daredevil with writer Anne Nascenti and notice that his artwork has started to become more distinct. It's blockier, and that style gets locked in with his Daredevil limited series Man Without Fear, written by Frank Miller. I see a lot of the dynamic shapes used by artists like Frank Miller and Jack Kirby by John Romita Jr.'s work in this era. And then, by the 2000s, Romita worked with J. Michael Straczynski on a big, amazing Spider-Man run, and was getting into creator-owned comics with his work on stuff like Kick-Ass. By the end of that period, his faces have become a little more simplified and cartoony. His characters are even blockier and his layouts utilize a lot of hard vertical and horizontal lines. But, as I say, this is all on a continuum, so while you can see differences by jumping every 15 years or so, the style change was much slower along the way when you insert stuff like his X-Men runs in the middle. But there are also two distinct reasons why Ramita's artwork changes over time. One is that Ramita is always trying to prove himself, and he pushes himself. The second is that when you look at his pencils, there's actually a lot of room for interpretation by his inkers. We'll come back to that second point. Ramita clearly felt the need to prove himself out of the gate since his father is so beloved. And his initial Spider-Man run is great, introducing the Hobgoblin among other things. His artwork is cinematic, with elaborate establishing panels for its time and large, robust action scenes. He was let go from his following job, a well-received run on X-Men, due to disagreements with the writer and editor. He ended up on Daredevil, following a critically acclaimed run by Frank Miller. But even though this run is very, very different, it looks gorgeous. Daredevil goes up against very different opponents than his usual street criminals, including Avengers enemy Ultron and the demon Mephisto. There are no shortcuts in the artwork, and his miniseries with Frank Miller retelling Daredevil's origin is my personal favorite work by John Romita Jr. It is loaded with detail, features extremely clean storytelling, and a fascinating mix of ruled lines, and organic curves that contrast well. Other times when Ramita seems to put in extra effort to secure his status include his X-Men run in the early 90s, when he had passed on the invitation to help found Image Comics. There's also his Eternals miniseries with fan-favorite writer Neil Gaiman. Or his creator-owned work, like The Gray Area and Kick-Ass, an especially successful series that he did with writer Mark Miller. There's also his current return to Marvel on Spider-Man, following a foray into working at DC for a few years. Ramita Jr. is one of the few artists working today who has done two simultaneous monthly titles. He had a run on Thor and Spider-Man running concurrently. The days of being able to draw two monthly books without assistance is long gone, thanks to modern printing being capable of and requiring more detail. Looking at Ramita's pencils, they are often tight, but he shades a lot of stuff with the side of the pencil. Decisions like that mean that his inkers have a lot of say in interpreting his work, and I'd argue there are three inkers who have figured out different approaches to his art that work very well. We'll first look at Al Williamson, who takes some of the shadowy areas and gives them texture and gradation. There is a lot of thin lines to emphasize detail. Scott Hanna, by comparison, seems much more willing to flesh in dark areas with a thick black brush. It's got a lot of bold lines that help delineate the subject from the finer details of the environment. 
This artwork is deceptively simple looking, but really, it's a lot of precise decisions on which lines to emphasize. The details on things like city, webbing, or rain is incredible. Klaus Janssen is one of the most respected inkers in the business. Janssen inks Ramita very similar to how he did with Frank Miller. There's a blockiness to the musculature. There are a lot of parallel lines to indicate form and shape. There's a bit more of a looseness to the line work, but it gives it energy and personality. I'd argue that when readers complain about Ramita, it's mostly because he's been paired with an inker that isn't making the best possible choices to interpret his work. I love the inks of folks like Jansen and Tom Palmer, but I would be very curious to have seen other interpretations of Ramita's Superman, or the kids in Kick-Ass. There's a loyalty to the line art there, but it might be too stylized. It's a tricky balance. Ramita himself said that what he looks for in an inker is, quote, somebody who can add his style to it and not overpower. John Ramita Jr. has said in various interviews that he considers some decisions that he's made to have been potential setbacks to his career. Whether that's true or not, we'll never really know. But, you know, he stepped away from an X-Men run that he was doing very well on to work on Daredevil, Man Without Fear, which I would argue was the right decision, but he had been told by Marvel that he could come right back. Well, <laughs> Marvel ended up loving the work of Joe Matarera, and he was not able to come back to that very well-paying, highly viewed title. Um, he had stepped away from his original X-Men run to help Marvel do their spin-off universe, their new universe on the title Star Brand, that didn't really connect with people. Um, he said that he was curious what would have happened if he had agreed to leave Marvel with the other superstar artists that formed Image, because they had asked him if he wanted to. Uh, you know, who knows? We'll never know if that uh, helped or hurt him. All I know is that if he has perceived it thus, it means that it's given him an extra drive and a passion to prove himself and succeed. So now let's take a look at what I will argue he does very, very well. Setting aside John Romita Jr.'s style, it would be hard to argue against his storytelling skills. He sets up intricate, dynamic, heavily detailed establishing scenes. You could argue he makes New York itself a character with the attention he gives it. There are no shortcuts with John Romita Jr.'s art. He never shies away from using three-point perspective with a cityscape, for instance. If a scene is set in a hospital, you can be sure that he's referenced the medical equipment very carefully and isn't making something up. Romita Jr. has a cinematic style, by which I mean emphasis on action, emotion, lighting, and clear panel-to-panel -panel transitions, such that you'll never be confused where characters are in relationship to one another or with important objects within a scene. There's an energy to his action, a focus on the result of a powerful impact, and careful consideration of how to make the human body look if it's at the extreme end of an action. His characters shift their hip into a punch. He has them bringing their weight down in a landing. Every popular artist can do at least one thing exceptionally. In my opinion, nobody draws rain better than John Romita Jr. It is just gorgeous. And one thing I've always appreciated about John Romita Jr. is that he stays up to date with his artwork. For instance, if Jack Kirby, beloved as he is, drew a car, it was pretty much always a jalopy from the 40s. But when you compare John Romita Jr.'s Peter Parker from the late 70s to the 90s to today, as well as his supporting cast, they are wearing clothes that are current. His original X-Men run had the mutants out of costume plenty, and he would update them for the time period. Storm in a mohawk and black leather might not make as much sense today, but it was up to the minute when he created it in the 80s. Let me close this out by taking a look at some of the common criticisms of John Romita Jr.'s art. I can only offer my opinion, but let's do it. One thing I've heard people complain about is that Romita Jr.'s artwork is too blocky. Ultimately, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but I used to think the same thing about Jack Kirby's artwork. And at a certain point, I looked at Kirby's artwork differently. 
I realized that it wasn't meant to be literal and realistic. It was done that way to show the way that Kirby wanted things to look. It was idealized and personalized. I see that with Ramita's artwork. The shapes underlying everything are there to aim the eye at the action. The contrast of shapes and lines butting up against each other in unique ways. Some people don't care for how he draws faces. I think this has been a more recent evolution. There are more lines on his faces today than his earliest work. It's there to define form. And of the criticisms out there, I do understand this one the best. It can make some characters look older than they should. And his faces for kids and teens has become even more simplified and can look cartoony. I think the goal here is to make them more expressive. But some of it is also that Ramita aims to turn his work in on time. He's referred to his art style as deadline style, as in he gives it the amount of time he can and still be able to turn in the finished work on time every time. I think that's fair and accurate because plenty of his faces can still look pretty similar to how he started out. I think he makes some decisions based on how much time he can allocate to a book and still finish it on time. And ultimately, that makes me very curious to see what would happen if John Romita Jr. decided to make a full graphic novel without a firm deadline attached to it, the same way that guys like uh, Barry Windsor Smith created Monsters, or these days Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips make the reckless graphic novels. I'd be very curious to see what happens with John Romita Jr.'s artwork in that kind of a scenario. Hopefully we do get to see something like that someday. In the meantime, one thing that's always clear when I look at his artwork is that the man loves superheroes, and I believe that that passion does shine through. Folks, thanks so much for taking some of your time to watch this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more, yeah, I almost got that out. If you want to see more, you can always hit subscribe. I've got quite a backlog. I also want to let you know, I always have a live show on Monday afternoons at 5 p.m. Pacific, but that's on my other channel, which is called Pros and Cons. And on that show, I review the past week's comics and discuss the latest news of the week as it pertains to comic books. It's a lot of fun. Um, I read questions from the audience and I'll try different things if they're popular, like uh, various TikTok challenges or maybe a review of a comic book related movie or TV show. It's a lot of fun. So please consider checking that out. Thank you for giving me some of your time. I'll be back next week. And until then, keep reading comics. Whoa, 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 me. I almost forgot that I wanted to give a shout out to Dynamite Comics for sending me this art book on the Ramita Legacy. This is a great book about both John Ramita Sr. and Jr., their career, um, featuring some interviews by the late, great Tom Spurgeon. This was a really helpful volume in terms of getting the timeline right when I was looking at the evolution of his style. It was just nice to get some insight from both artists. Dynamite produces a lot of great art books and I wanted to give a shout out to this one in particular. Definitely interesting if you want to learn more about either of the Ramitas. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider hitting like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the show, there are merchandise links beneath the YouTube video, and you can always hit join on YouTube or visit Comic Tropes on Patreon to get access to special perks.